Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Meghdoot, and uh, I manage uh, the container platform development at PayPal. Um, so welcome to the talk. And uh, just before we dive into the talk itself, um, a little quick show of hands on people uh, familiar with Apache Mesos. OK. Um, and uh, how about uh, Docker Compose? OK. Um, so the topic of today is uh, how to run container pods uh, with Docker Compose in Apache Mesos. And uh, with that, uh, this is pretty much the goal of the talk, that uh, with Apache Mesos and Docker both getting treated as first-class citizens, uh, how to run container uh, pods in it. And uh, by first-class citizens, meaning that um, the developers and, and operations is using the Docker runtime, the Docker tool set, the volumes, uh, the network uh, plugins with network, uh, lib network, and just not the Docker image itself and having a different runtime like Rocket or something else. So you're treating Docker as first class in your ecosystem, and then you already have Apache Mesos running also. So in, in case of PayPal, we were running Mesos uh, before containers came into the picture. Um, so it was running POSIX uh, processes, and when containers came in, you did not want to switch our cluster manager just because of uh, uh, other like non-port support there for some time. Um, and the other aspect was uh, we wanted developers to run the container pods locally in their laptop or desktop without even getting worried about cluster managers. Uh, get that going, and when they want to take it into QA and production, use the same specification uh, to run it uh, in those environments so that there is no drift and translation uh, errors. And uh, with that, uh, the solution which we kind of built, and we just released it uh, last week, uh, it's out there and open now, uh, a Docker Compose Mesos Executor. And uh, we will go through all the details um, in the talk. So uh, what exactly are pods? So uh, pods uh, loosely are a collection of Docker containers, which you are bundling them together and, and scheduling and, and deploying them uh, as a unit. So you kind of treat them as a single scaling unit. So every instance is a collection of these pods. Um, now, two uh, important things to keep in mind is all the containers which you are bundling together as this unit um, will most likely share namespaces. So network namespaces is the most common thing. So uh, one of the containers in the pod uh, will have the primary uh, network interfaces and the IP associated uh, with it. And the rest of the containers in the pod will just collapse and use the same interface and, and IP. You can collapse PID or IPC namespace as well, but network is the most common. The second point for pod definition is this group of containers treated as a unit will be capped by a C group uh, uh, label or, 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 a, or a top level C group or a common C group so that the resources consumed by this pod in total, whether it's like memory or CPU or, or disk, is kind of capped. Um, and that is to ensure that it does not steal resources from other pods running in the host. Um, now, the containers, individual containers in the pod, um, you can constrain them, you may not constrain them, so they can fight within each other to steal resources, it's up to uh, the configuration, but the whole unit as a whole needs to be kind of capped. And the last point is very important, so if you are using a, a cluster manager and you have like different containers and you are using just constraints to make sure all of them land into the same host and say, oh, that is my pod, that isn't, because you are most likely not collapsing network namespaces, you are most definitely not capping all these containers under a common C group uh, to limit resources. So uh, co-location using constraints is not pod. Um, so why are uh, pod needed? Why are pods needed? So the first use case, or the first point is definitely true uh, for PayPal. Uh, as we are migrating our, our legacy workloads, which were running in VMs, um, into the container ecosystem, uh, pods help in a lift and shift kind of strategy. So let's say you have three processes or applications running in that VM. Some of them might be using localhost communication. You just don't know all the details. So you, you model them in a pod, treat them as a unit, and bring it to the cluster manager. And that actually gives time to start refactoring. You, you can't go to microservices in day one. Um, and the other fact is, um, that as you are bringing these pods together in the same host, 
you say, oh, there is a common container in both the pods which you can refactor into like a single intern system service container. And those things come like organically and you don't have to like worry all about that uh, before uh, hand. So pods is really helping uh, lift and shift of the legacy mic um, uh, workloads. The second point is uh, definitely the microservices and composite uh, 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 containers um, uh, or composite services uh, through containers is well supported through pods. So whether it's a sidecar, ambassador, adapter patterns, um, you, you can definitely model it through pods um, and it's a very uh, uh, common pattern in that case. Um, the third point is oftentimes in, in traditional deployment environments, you will have like a pre-deployment step uh, in the node you are deploying and then you deploy your actual application and then, then you might have like post-deployment steps. So if you are just running uh, a, a pod, some of those tasks can be like um, achieved through short-lived uh, uh, containers. They could be data containers, they could be just uh, containers running some steps and then going away. Uh, and that can be cleanly uh, a model through pod as well. So those are the three use cases uh, we, I can think of uh, why pods are needed. So with that, I will just uh, go through Docker Compose and Mesos kind of recap and then we will uh, dive into the uh, solution. So Compose uh, has been there in the community for a long time. It used to be called Fig and Docker acquired the, the team and it was called uh, Compose after that. Um, it provides you a specification of running containers through a YAML file, so you don't have to remember all the Docker run options and pass it like that. And on top of that, it has ordering primitives and certain um, other um, uh, semantics there. Um, and you can both specify and, and run just through command line in, in Compose. Now, two things has happened uh, lately. So there is a 2.x Compose version series. I believe 2.1 is the latest one. So that uh, preserves strictly all the uh, local features. Uh, by meaning that is Compose um, always interacted with a single Docker engine. So you launch all the containers with a single Docker engine that could be most likely locally running in your laptop or it may be in a remote uh, uh, location, but you are launching the containers against a single engine. Um, version 3.x, which is the, uh, the other series, uh, it is basically composed with Docker Swarm, that's the cluster management uh, integration. And as they introduced uh, certain uh, options there like Docker Compose Deploy and things like that, they took away certain parameters which meant or which made sense in a, in a local pod kind of environment. So 3.x actually deprecates uh, certain features. Now, uh, 2.x and 3.x are both alive, and I think they are working on collapsing them in, in some form, but uh, to call that out. So if you wanted to uh, model pods through uh, Docker Compose, um, uh, let's see what we can do. With the, the Compose tooling is already there. So you can define containers um, uh, all in that sing, uh, YAML file. They are bundled together, relies on the 2.x for sure. Um, you can, if you have written your libnet, net, lib network plugins, um, your volume plugins, you can specify them in the compose file. It could be pre-created or you can create right through the compose file themselves. You can collapse network namespaces or other namespaces. It doesn't happen by default. So in the compose file, you have to say, use the namespace of the other container, but you can do any combination of the containers defined in the compose file. And we will see the examples when we do the demo there. Um, you can define ordering of the containers uh, in the pod. So before, uh, there used to be a depends on primitive in, comp uh, in, in Compose. So you can say, uh, con let container B start after container A has started, and sometimes you need that uh, sequence. But what used to happen is if the process inside the container B um, started faster than the process inside the container A, you just had a reverse order now and a lot of the legacy applications broke. So people had different kind of uh, uh, containers injected for weight. There was no uh, uh, thing supported. Uh, in 2.x, uh, uh, support is now there for health check of the containers. So you can say, let container B start when container A's health check has passed. So much more strict ordering uh, uh, guarantees um, now you can do in 2.x. Uh, as I said, uh, you, you can uh, point to external created volumes and networks. Um, multiple files uh, can be dedicated uh, in, in Compose files that are merged. So you can have a base file, you can have a QA environment file and a production file, and you can merge those uh, definitions 
uh, that. So it's pretty powerful. We definitely use that in PayPal. Um, and uh, last but not the least, you can uh, run a bunch of these uh, uh, pods through Compose in the same host uh, without getting conflicts. Um, they name them uh, differently with certain configurations. So one of the things definitely missing here is that uh, point we made in the pod definition is bringing all these containers under a common C group. So even if you use Compose, uh, each of these containers will have the top level C group uh, 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 created. Um, so that part uh, doesn't happen. And uh, the collapsing, you have to explicitly say that. So that doesn't, um, a collapsing of the namespaces, I mean. So we will, we will revisit things during the demo. I wanted to do a, a recap of the uh, Mesos uh, architecture. So uh, as you see in the, in the Mesos uh, architecture, it's a cluster manager. It has the master and the worker uh, models. So uh, Mesos master, there's a primary master. The other two masters are, are more than that uh, in, the, in the quorum. It's not a quorum, actually. They are passive. Um, you have different frameworks. Uh, it's a two-level scheduler. We'll uh, dive a little uh, deeper. Uh, you can have uh, Marathon, which is a, a framework for services. Similarly, Aurora is there. You can have Cassandra frameworks, Kafka frameworks. And the uh, Mesos agent is the agent running in all your hosts where your actual workload is running. Um, Mesos uh, agents do have a concept of containerizer, which is Mesos definition of a container. Um, and we will cover what is that. Now, uh, the executor is your task lifecycle manager, manager, you can think of that way. Um, and the T1, T2, those are the actual workloads getting run. It could be Docker containers, it could be KVM, it could be unikernel, it could be POSIX processes. So in the whole Mesos ecosystem, the primitives are such that the frameworks, the masters, the agent doesn't know what actual workload you're running. So the executor is the one which implements the primitives and knows what actual workload is running and how to maintain the life cycle of those workloads. So it's really agnostic um, in, in that sense. Okay, some of the key uh, abstractions in the Mesos world. Um, the agent, if you see at the bottom, um, this is where your uh, application uh, workloads are running. The agents typically will advertise resources to the master saying this is the how much memory and CPU and disk resources. You could have GPU, uh, uh, you, you can uh, figure that one out, what you want. And they advertise the resources to the master. And the master in turn advertises these resources to the frameworks. So uh, you can have multiple frameworks competing for these resources uh, and for the different workloads they are uh, supposed to run. And the frameworks uh, will then decide which offers best match for the uh, application workloads. So then they will basically say to the master, I want to pick uh, resources offered from host number one and host number five. And by the way, here is the executor to launch that task. Um, and then the master will get that details and then contact those agents and launch the task and say, by the way, use that executor. Again, the master doesn't know what kind of workload it's running. It just knows that how much resources will be consumed um, and the agent as well. So that is kind of uh, the, the abstractions um, in, in the Mesos model. And different executors can coexist in the, in the, in the same um, host running uh, different workloads. So to double click uh, in how uh, we obviously implemented uh, executor uh, dedicated for Docker Compose kind of workloads. And we, we mentioned that in Docker Compose Executor. So if you look at the top box, uh, that's the uh, Mesos agent. And uh, it uses the default Mesos containerizer. Now, um, there is a concept of isolators um, in, in containerizer. So isolators help define the top level Mesos container, which I mentioned. And so in this case, we are using the C groups memory and CPU isolator to get this like bottom gray box, if it's your parent container um, created with the parent C group uh, in, in Mesos. And then your executor task is actually the main task running under the C group. So Mesos is pretty much monitoring this parent uh, task uh, in, in the parent C, top level C group. Uh, what we do in Compose Executor is then launch this actual uh, pod, which is this collection of containers 
under uh, the parent C group and maintain the hierarchy. So this, uh, 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 so if I go to the next point and say this helps uh, uh, achieve the pod criteria of making sure that the containers coming up um, in the pod has a common C group. And so uh, you can uh, define uh, the C group CFS HUD uh, limit, so uh, throttle uh, the, the maximum kind of CPU. You can have memory limits so that uh, containers can be oomed, the entire pod will be uh, uh, oomed, oomed killed uh, in that case. Now the point is uh, the individual containers in the pod, Docker gives you options today with minus minus CPUs uh, as of the latest and memory uh, to kind of cap the individual resources of the container. But in this case, even if you don't do that, you have a parent uh, C group who, which has the resources for that entire pod. So even if, you, even if one of the containers is acting bad and stealing more resources, the minute it goes over the uh, parent C group resources, it will be taken care of uh, uh, by, by Mesos uh, and, and, the, and the C group itself. So um, that's what I said, individual containers will not be limited uh, unless specified, but cannot go over the parent. And the last point is, um, when we have a C group hierarchy, CPUs are throttled, but um, for the memory, you have to make sure the use hierarchy flag is enabled, um, and that will ensure uh, things are in order. Now, um, we will now go into the details of the Compose Executor and how it works and what feature it's, it's bringing uh, by default. So um, as an executor, um, going back to the programming model, it implements the callbacks to maintain the life cycle of a pod. So uh, these are the primitives and the callbacks uh, which is to implement with the Mesos agent um, so that it can, it can launch a pod, it can kill a pod in, in terms of the task uh, primitives. Um, so uh, by default, um, you can give a series of compose files, and we can see in, in the, we'll see in the demo shortly. Uh, but uh, this addition of the C group, so Docker uh, run uh, takes a C group parent uh, kind of uh, uh, option. So in this case, the executor will figure figure out what is your parent Mesos C group and add it uh, to the containers in the pod. It will add other important labels like executor ID and task ID, so you can do Docker PS and filter uh, those if needed. Um, so it, it will do a bunch of things uh, similar to that. It will collapse the network namespace by default in all the containers in the pod. So localhost works for all the containers in, in communicating uh, with each other inside the pod, and they, they share the same IP. Um, there will be a pod uh, health check monitor which gets launched. Uh, this is uh, not only kind of monitoring that whether one of the containers in the pod crashed out, in that case, the default behavior is completely kill the pod because uh, we don't want to know like whether it's an important container or, or a sidecar or whatever it is, we, we kill it. Um, but uh, with the addition of the Docker health checks, it is oftentimes that your container may be up, but your health check is failing. Um, it, it is in a, in a bad state. So we will detect that and also kind of kill the pod because when you're running the cluster manager, it's better to kill it and, and have a, a new pod uh, come up. So it, it supports running uh, multiple compose files. Um, it also implements, and, and this is outside of the executor, the project defines a Mesos module and we'll cover what Mesos modules are um, to prevent uh, container pod leaks in case the executor crashes out. Uh, because remember, the executor is, is managing the life cycle of the pod, and what if uh, it, it crashes out, your containers will keep running, um, and so the module will help uh, to clean those things out, and we'll see that uh, in the demo as well. Um, the, the DCE Go, I did not explain the name of that, Docker Compose Executor, we implemented this in Go. There was an earlier version with Java, and of course, uh, the JVM completely sucks uh, out performance if you're running 40 pods in a large uh, uh, node. So it's in Go, um, and a lot of features has been implemented in, in this uh, specific version. So what exactly are plugins? We will cover that uh, in the next slide. And uh, last but not the least, um, any existing Mesos uh, frameworks, whether it's Marathon or Aurora 
or Singularity, whatever uh, you have for running services, you can just plug and play without making any changes in the framework. Okay, with that, let me look at the time. Okay, so uh, what, what exactly are plugins? So plugins provide a way to easily extend the inner workings of a uh, Docker Compose executor. Um, so think of, think as plugins, I will just uh, get all the points here. Uh, think as plugins uh, to customize the behavior as you are launching the pod. So we have hooks before the launch and before the launch task primitive, before and after the launch task, and similarly before and after the kill task. So whether uh, at runtime you are deciding on what uh, pre-existing network to configure the pod with. Remember, the idea is the developer has run the pod locally with their bridge or uh, network mode host and is specifying the same pod files in, in the production or QA environment. And at runtime, you decide that I'm using a container networking solution. Here are the, uh, the network details. Here are maybe some volumes you are mounting certain runtime labels you are injecting. So you can do all those massaging before the actual pod is launched. Um, and you can actually even get resources uh, and, and uh, free up resources. So that helps you to uh, customize uh, behavior to plugins. Uh, and you can have multiple plugins. Uh, they can be uh, chained um, in order. So different teams can contribute towards it. So uh, we do provide a, a default plugin. And the default plugin um, adds labels like Meso's task ID and executor ID against every container in the pod. So that if you're in the host and you're using Docker PS minus minus filter and, and you want to like quickly get to containers of a certain uh, Meso's task, you should be able to uh, use that. Uh, we, uh, by default, add uh, the, the Meso's parent uh, uh, task uh, C group uh, to all the containers. And then, um, as we looked before, that uh, Compose doesn't collapse the network namespace by default. So what happens in, in this case, uh, we create a secret kind of infrastructure container in the pod, and you can define it uh, in, in the plugin. And that creates the main uh, network interfaces, gets the IP, and all other containers in the pod basically collapses uh, against this infrastructure container. It's similarly how Kubernetes pods work is just that they create the infrastructure container uh, as well. It's just you don't see it. Um, okay, with that, um, we will we will cover what exactly are uh, Mesos modules. Uh, we specifically use a module called Hook. So um, just like uh, plugins extend the Docker Compose executor's default behavior, um, one thing about plugins, these are just uh, Go modules which you will compile in with the executor. Um, in, in case of Mesos modules, these are actually shared libraries uh, which are dynamically loaded. Um, it, it could be in the master or the agent uh, to extend uh, the inner functionality. Um, Mesos modules, very, very important is you have to build it against the version of Mesos you're running in the cluster. Uh, and uh, in the project which we have put out in the open, you have full instructions uh, how to build modules and we have a Docker container which will uh, uh, help in building the Mesos module against any Mesos versions you want. Uh, we have provided all the, all the good practices on, on building a modules because that one is not documented very well. Um, there are different classification of modules. So there is allocation module which can switch the default uh, DRF uh, allocation algorithm of Mesos on, on scheduling side. Um, you have isolator modules which we saw that in that slide we had uh, different isolators inside a containerizer. And then there is a, a module called hooks. Now, uh, hooks are basically uh, a way to tie into the events um, that a task has been launched, a task has been killed. Uh, when these things are happening, um, these uh, hook uh, endpoints are called by the Mesos uh, agent or, or the master. So we uh, very specifically uh, implement one of the events, which is the executor removal event. Um, and this we will uh, see in the demo when uh, executor crashes, um, the, the Mesos agent will still detect that the executor exited. And you have an additional way to intercept that and make sure whether the pods were really cleaned up or it was leaked or things like that. And that hook is guaranteed to get called. 
Um, okay. So, um, how is the current ecosystem around pods looking as of last week? Let's put it that way because every cluster manager is like moving very fast. So, Docker Swarm as of 1.2.6, that's the latest version. I think it will move to 17 versions as well. Uh, does not support local pods. So, you, you cannot uh, 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 have native support for uh, local pods. What they have is the Docker Compose 3.x version. You can launch the set of containers in Docker Swarm. So they will land in multiple hosts in the cluster. And by default, they will have an overlay network so that all these containers can locally uh, talk to each other. But they are not treated as a single unit to be co-located, sharing C groups uh, or, or namespaces. So it's, it is not a pod. Um, I think they are working something on it. So in, in the future, that should help. Um, Kubernetes has excellent support for pods. In fact, they are the ones who coined the term pods, um, but uh, they don't treat uh, Docker as first class. And by that, uh, I, I mean is they have uh, different volume specs uh, when you want to do uh, storage integrations. Um, they have different, uh, they don't follow lib network. They have their own specs for network integration is CNI. Um, so if you're looking at the CRI uh, runtime, which till date used to call Docker engine, is actually going to switch to container D. There is a project active because container D has been donated to CNCF and uh, they will completely skip Docker engine to, to launch the Kubernetes pods. Um, they don't need uh, runtime in, in future. And of course, uh, their pod spec is different than the compose spec. Um, and um, you, 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 and even the Docker commands don't work in the Kubernetes cluster. As I said, they set up the uh, networking differently. They uh, uh, provide equivalent commands, uh, but uh, not uh, all Docker commands uh, will work. So it's, it's pretty much, uh, you will have the image, which is the common minimum thing, but it is a, it's a different environment. Um, nothing bad about it, but that's how uh, Kubernetes uh, is kind of uh, going ahead. And uh, Mesos, um, for a long, long time, used to natively support running Docker containers through a Docker containerizer. But what it did was it used to only spawn one container against a task. So you could not ever run a collection of containers against a task. So in 1.1, they added a pod support through experimental task groups and nested container. But this is not for Docker. So they have again taken the primitive option of it's a collection of tasks which you can model as a pod. So the tasks could be containers, could be POSIX processes, could be something else. Um, and obviously that, that specification is different than something like a, a Compose spec. Um, and uh, they are also um, going towards a universal containerizer approach um, to kind of swap out Docker runtime to say that we will implement all the different isolators, whether it's a volume isolator, network isolator, to create a, 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 a container runtime, which can consume a Docker image, but it's not the Docker runtime. Um, however, as I mentioned in the last point, Mesos still continues to be the most uh, flexible cluster manager out there, because literally, uh, it can run any sort of workloads, uh, unikernels, containers, KVMs, POSIX, processes. Um, it's, it's not tied uh, uh, to containers. And we could do something like Docker Compose Executor with Mesos as well. With that, I think um, I, will, I will switch um, to the demo a little bit to see all of this, uh, what we talked about in action. So I have a Vagrant setup running um, and everything is local because I did not want to trust on the Wi-Fi connection. Um, so I have uh, even the Docker registry running locally in Vagrant. Uh, so what uh, I'm going to do now is launch, uh, so let's see what we have a uh, little quick. We have the, the Mesos uh, master uh, view. It's uh, showing that there are no tasks running right now in the cluster. We have uh, Aurora uh, here, which is a framework in Mesos to run services or long-running tasks. We have Marathon, which is also another popular competing framework to launch uh, running tasks, uh, long-running tasks. And uh, with that, uh, first we are going to launch a workload in, in Aurora. Now, Aurora comes with a, a CLI uh, client. We wrote uh, a, a Thrift uh, Go library against it. Uh, it's open sourced as well. And I'm going to just uh, 
launch, and I will we'll go through the details of that. Uh, we will also launch a task in Marathon in parallel, so we can have things up and running as we go through it. So let's go here, go to Marathon, create application, JSON node. So what we are trying to do is launch a pod. In this case, we have given 0.5 CPU, 64 megs uh, memory to the pod. Uh, we said we need three dynamic ports, executor. And then uh, the URI is, is a standard way in Mesos to say what resource artifacts you want the Mesos agent to download before you start the workload. Um, so in, in this case, the app tar uh, has the Docker Compose files inside it, uh, <laughs> along with the uh, application bundle. So with that, we'll just do a, we will launch that. Now if you go to Mesos, we see the workload uh, which was started by Aurora uh, is already launched. So let's uh, go to the sandbox to see what else is happening there. So there's a folder here. Now um, you see Docker Compose, uh, uh, the YAML file, let's say that was the file which the developer tested in its development environment. So if you open it, and bringing it, this is actually pure compose. You mentioned the version at the top, and uh, is it okay, or I should increase the font a little bit. Increase the font. Okay, um, so uh, you can see there is a Node.js uh, service running, we have a Nginx uh, service running, and in this case, Nginx is uh, doing the SSL termination uh, for Node, um, and there's a reason for that. Node is not super efficient in that. And they are using, let's say, in a local environment, they are using bridge networking. They even are hard coding the ports, uh, what port they want in host as well, um, as we see from this example. And then uh, they define a health check uh, for the web, or the Node.js container, and it can mean a different Compose file. Compose merges those files. Now, uh, when Compose Executor launched, uh, it created first the infrastructure container. So the infrastructure container is the secret container. It, it is defined as a, a service uh, there. And uh, the first thing you see is it, it got all the ports defined in the different uh, Compose files uh, uh, together as part of the network container itself, because for Docker, the primary container, which is setting up the interface, has to get the ports uh, there as well. So it, it does that. Um, in the C group parent, if you see, uh, we specify what is the parent Mesos C group, so it is there as well. And then labels like executor ID and task ID, these are Mesos label has been added, um, and we are using bridge networking in this case. Now if I see the generated Docker compose the base file and we generated this file out of it. The port uh, sections have vanished, as you see, because ports have now landed in the network proxy. Um, here is the network mode, which is now using the collapsed network namespace um, of, the, of the network proxy there. So uh, that is how um, uh, things are uh, as we are collapsing namespaces. And um, if we go back here, we see actually Marathon has also started uh, the task. Now, one of the things we will see here different to see the plugin now in action is the same example which we launched is if I open the Docker Compose generated file, there has been an additional test label getting attached to the container, and this is what the plugin uh, implemented. So the plugin definitions are here, so let me go here, the config. So this is uh, what is saying that the general plugin is by default uh, uh, bundled with the executor, but if you have other plugins, you can define that. The code is already compiled in, in, inside the executor, but it activates your plugins as you go forward, or as you configure. Now we will do quick uh, two things. So what we will do is, uh, we're going to sh see some things real quick. So I do a Docker PS. Uh, we see a pod running in two minutes. This is where Marathon launched it, and four minutes, which is the set of containers which uh, Aurora launched. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill, as if simulating a container crashing out, the Node.js container here um, in the pod run by 
marathon. And uh, if you go here to Mesos and open the sandbox and open the logs, the logs will actually uh, show you all what is happening with the executor. So if you see, uh, it detected that the pod failed. Um, and then it is signaling to Mesos agent that actually we are killing the entire pod and consider the task as failed. And when, when Mesos gets those uh, things, it will go and replace. Um, so if you just see, uh, it's running just now because Mesos got the signal, kill the pod, and has restarted the pod. So uh, one last example, I want to say if I do a Docker PS here, um, it's just coming up, 26 seconds, if you see. Um, one thing I want to sh show is a rare, rare scenario of the modules coming into the picture. So we'll have... So uh, the first executor is the one which uh, Marathon is running. Um, uh, the second one is what Aurora is running. So what I'm going to do is think you are upgrading your Mesos agent and your Mesos agent is not uh, running. Uh, the, the tasks continue to run in this world. So I'm going to just stop it. And then I'm going to uh, just kill uh, the executor there. Let me see. Um, three, one, two, zero. Three, one, two, zero. So your executor basically crashed out. So if I'm doing Docker PS, uh, everything is running. Your containers are supposed to run by default when agent doesn't run because there is checkpointing enabled. But when the executor crashed out, your containers are still leaking here. Now what I do, uh, at least the containers managed by the marathon task. So what we do is we start, let's say maintenance has completed, slave is, or the agent is coming up. And if we do a Docker PS real quick, you see, uh, basically see the containers have vanished. Um, because uh, as the slave started, agent started up, it actually uh, uses the checkpointing uh, feature in Mesos to figure it out what are the executors which are supposed to run, what are not. And for the exited executors, it fired that hook which we intercepted and cleaned up the containers which the executor could not uh, clean up. And uh, if I'm back to the Mesos dashboard, you can see the containers are basically now again getting respawned because they were killed um, in that sense. And um, uh, in, the, in the true sense, if you want to kill the entire pod because you really want to kill it, uh, I don't want to do a create application anymore. I can just destroy the application, which will call the lifecycle management methods to kill a pod in the executor. And I can blow both of them out, actually. And that is the, pretty much the end of the demo. Um, we can do a kill in Aurora. And that should do it. And it will take a while uh, to Mesos to get the signal. So one of the tasks has already been killed. The second one uh, will get killed um, as it's happening. So um, that was pretty much the demo. and. Uh, uh, so we have the uh, executor, which is out there in the open, in the first point. The second one says which uh, Java executor we deprecated. It doesn't have a lot of features. And I took the diagrams from Mesos from this talk. Didn't want to reinvent the wheel here. Um, so quick re recap was you have Mesos as the cluster management of choice. You, you love Docker engine and all the Docker tooling with it. You don't want to let go of that thing. And you want to solve this problem at scale. So that is um, the recap of the talk. Um, the engineers working in this project, uh, Kumar and Mia, are here as well. So we can uh, take any questions if we go um, after this. So I, I can take questions at this point. Yep. So uh, you mentioned that in uh, Mesos 1.1, it's now support for uh, groups. Yes. Um, so uh, we'd actually done some work on that because we were also looking for pod support. Got it. Um, Right. Um, you know, what you think is not yet in Mesos 1.1. One, one. Right. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, one thing about uh, the task groups and the nestos, uh, nested container feature is, A, you have to make changes in the framework. So if you're using Aurora, Marathon has started adding, I think, added the features. If you're using Aurora or Singularity first, 
to even consume that feature, you have to make changes in the framework. Whereas the approach we have taken is you can just plug and uh, play with the frameworks. The second thing is uh, we wanted to uh, really uh, say that developers don't care about cluster managers as they are developing in their local environment and let them define the, the pod specs and things like that. And we can we take the exact spec file and run it in a cluster manager? You can't do that because now, as we said, even Kubernetes or the task groups will have a different way to define the same containers. Of course, we can run like write translators and things like that. So we'll just wait and watch uh, how, how things are. So yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. But I'm just curious, have you experienced any scale issues maybe related to the Docker uh, engine crashing? Docker engine crashing, yeah, and things like that. So um, uh, one thing is if you are having a cluster manager behind the scenes, some of those things can often get masked because if the engine crashes, by default, it does take the containers down with it, unless you're using the live restore flag. Um, and the cluster will just replace the running tasks in another healthy node. Uh, if you don't have a cluster manager uh, behind the scenes, then you are having issues that, yes, my engine is in a rear state. But we, have, we run it at large scale, especially the latest versions of Docker. Um, and we haven't seen the issues of the past, which we used to see a lot of the engine stability which uh, led to a lot of the people saying that we don't need the runtime. We haven't faced it. So uh, we have run this executor at scale in, in public clouds as well, up to like 50,000 of these pods running um, and, and haven't kind of faced uh, any issues. Yep. One of the primary points in your presentation, by the way, great presentation. Yeah, sure. Uh, was that you are running uh, all containers that are part of the pod on a single node. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to yeah, so that's the common pod versus uh, application group kind of concept. So if you are running, let's say, a web and a Redis or a MySQL, oh. it's a distributed, that is not a pod. So that you, you continue to do that. So your pod is, I have a main application container, but I need to run uh, uh, Nginx to do my SSL terminate. Or I have the sidecar container to do certain work, uh, uh, which is not the main application container's job but you still need that to, to make the application run. Um, and there is ambassador pattern, uh, there is adapter patterns where you are sending monitoring logs to a common uh, interface. So it is the application itself broken into components, uh, not the distributed nature of it. Uh, yeah, yep. I was mistaken because yeah. I was thinking that uh, it's like a single service. No. Pod, so it's multiple services which are different containers broken up, right? Um, so, a single service broken into smaller parts, yep. um, and that is what a pod is. Uh, but if your uh, system needs service A, service B, service C, service D, these would be actually different things not co-located together. But the service A needs to be co-located together with its components, right? Example? Um, Example, so for example, the example we showed in, in PayPal when we run Node.js, we run Nginx for, let's say, SSL termination, we run exactly like that. Um, a lot of people uh, use Prometheus as, let's say, the, the container, like monitoring and stats. Uh, you might have your application container doing legacy formatting of the log messages, which the sidecar container can consume and then uh, send it to Prometheus. So it's like a adapter container running with your application container. Uh, similarly, you can have ambassador containers where you don't want to say that your main endpoint is Redis, but you're running some sort of proxy so that from Redis you can change to memcache or something like that. So it's like a, you can run like service discovery uh, sidecar containers. So it is a, a very, very common pattern when you go to enterprise. 90% of the time you will have a situation you need sidecar containers. Yeah. Run that container there. 
because it shares the same local network, it has the same IP address, it has the same local volume, and so it can represent memcache into our service discovery ecosystem, or represent memcache into the, our logging system and adapt it in, without having to change the memcache Docker container itself. Uh, so we can create these standard sidecars so that anyone can say, well, use our logging system or use our uh, discovery system, just add this container to your collection of containers for your specific application as one app. Yeah. Well, and actually there was a great talk by uh, Brendan Burns in DockerCon uh, 15, 2015 about composition containers where he goes about all the patterns uh, of, of a pod. Okay, sounds good. I think uh, we give five minutes back. Thank you.